Hello and welcome. This is Chris from Soterra Media. This video is a first in a series looking into ways to pull off parts of the visual effects pipeline and the free version of DaVinci Resolve. So we're going to start with rotoscoping. It's one of the core skills expected of any visual effects artist. This will be a subsection of videos looking into various ways of pulling a mat. By pulling a mat, all I'm referring to are several different ways of isolating an element in a video from the background. In the case of rotoscoping, this is isolating a subject in a much more manual way. So instead of using a chroma key or other keyers, we break down our subject into many different parts and animate shapes over time to create a mat. Roto may sound daunting, but it isn't scary once you learn how to do it efficiently. We're going to look at a couple ways of doing it, including ways to tackle more difficult situations like hair. So let's start with the basics and grab our footage. We're going to start with something simple, a non-organic shape. Alrighty, so here we have our footage. So this is going to be just crazy simple. I just wanted to explore some really core concepts with it before we move on to something a little bit more challenging. So we're going to rotoscope this stop sign. So it's a simple shape, won't take much effort at all. Um, we'll be able to knock out this really quickly, but it'll demonstrate how we can use tracking to make things even simpler. So the, the first step that you want to take whenever you uh, begin to roto something is to analyze the footage and see what's going on. So in this case, we get really slight motion of the stop sign. So tracking probably wouldn't even be necessary in this case, but we're going to do it anyway just to kind of show how it works. We're also noticing that the, the stop sign isn't moving in perspective either. So it's not, it's not moving away from the camera towards the camera. It stays straight towards the camera the entire time, um, which also think, makes things a lot more simple. So in our case, there isn't really a best frame to start on. Pretty much all of them would be just fine. Um, the only thing that I do notice is at one point the stop sign has moved away from his hat a little bit more. So it's a little bit easier to see the outline of the stop sign itself. So that's probably a good frame to begin with. So we're going to start by tracking. So the way that we do that in this case is by way of a planar tracker, which if, it's, if that's not something you've used before, it basically is specialized in identifying and tracking surfaces that are flat. So in this case, it's pretty ideal for this. So let's grab a planar tracker. We can either right click add tool and go to tracking and then planar tracker or we can hit simply hit shift and spacebar and type in planar and that'll find a uh, find it for us so planar tracker so we'll go ahead and plug the output of our footage into the yellow background input on the planar tracker and what we'll do is first select the planar tracker we're going to set our reference frame to our current frame, which is 99 in this case. And then we'll draw our shape. Doesn't have to be perfect. Just has to cover areas of contrast. It's a little tricky with a stop sign because it's mostly red, but I think it'll track just fine. Now, it's important to note that this shape is not our final roto shape. This is simply just a shape that we create um, to tell the planar tracker where to track. So because of the way that planar tracking works, you'll want to make sure that this shape that you draw for the planar tracker is as close as you can to the edge where you're trying to roto, because that'll make sure that it's getting the maximum amount of stabilization possible. So what we'll do is we'll, now that we have our um, shape made, we'll click track to end, and then we'll jump to our reference frame, we'll hit go, and then we'll track to the start. So there we go. Now we'll head back to our reference frame, we'll hit go, and go back to that. And now the thing about the planar tracker node is it doesn't have any actual um, transform options inherent to it. So we'll need to create a planar transform. So once we have our planar transform, we'll go ahead and click on our planar tracker node to go back to our reference frame. And then we'll click on our planar transform. Now what we're going to be doing is transforming the roto shape that we create. In this case, we're going to grab a polygon. This is going to be a Bezier curve, but we're not going to actually use the Bezier handles. So you'll want to make sure that when you're clicking and drawing points, that you aren't 
dr clicking and dragging. Otherwise, we'll get uh, these Bezier handles. And we don't want that in this case. We just want straight lines. So we'll undo that. So we'll th then just draw around our stop sign. Now I am actually um, clicking a little bit inside it, this slightly, to be able to add some feathering uh, in the end. We want to make sure these line up nice to the corners. Now in this case, I'm just going to kind of ignore the hand, but um, it would be very simple. You would just click to here click to here, and then up and around and down. In this case, we're gonna skip that and just click like this. Now we've completed our shape. And what we can do then, is we'll plug this into the input on the planar transform. Now you wanna make sure that um, it doesn't plug into the effect mask because DaVinci Resolve may favor the effect mask because we are plugging a shape into it. So just make sure you end up in the yellow input. So now what we have going on here is our shape is um, going to be affected by our planar transform here. It's going to be tracked. So what we'll do is grab our media in and just control C, control V. We're going to grab another instance of it. And we're going to plug the output of the planar transform into the media in. Now we should have something like this. And if we scrub through, our shape should be following quite nicely. How about that? Now, of course, in most instances, um, when you use tracking, what it's going to be doing is simply assisting. So for most shapes, and especially organic shapes, tracking is just going to be something that speeds things up a little bit. It's not going to be something that will allow you to not actually transform any shapes. So what we always want to do is make sure that we go through here and make sure things are looking good. So an easy way to do that here is we'll grab a merge node and merge this whole deal over top. And we'll make this active just by clicking and dragging that in the viewport. And what we can do is we'll change the color of just the stop sign so we can see the edges a little bit easier. So we'll grab a color corrector, put that in between there, and we should be able to change this. I'm gonna use something a little extreme. So in this case, green. And that should be able to show us if there are any issues. And an important thing to do as well is in the polygon, um, we're just going to feather the edge a bit. So we're just uh, then the soft edge. What I'm doing is holding shift and then clicking and dragging this number to make that edge a little softer because in the video it is a little soft. And I'll see how we're looking. That ain't too bad. And if we want to, we can see that on its own. Yep, just like before. So we've isolated the mat. We can also check the alpha just by clicking up here, choosing alpha. That'll show us the alpha output. And we'll switch back to RGB. And that is the very basics of Pareto. So for the next shot we're gonna work on, we're gonna do something that we're you know, getting into a little bit more of the more advanced stuff, because this is pretty easy peasy. Alrighty, so this next clip is going to provide us with some new and uh, unique challenges. I think what we're going to do is rotoscope just this side of his hand. Now, as we can see, there's pretty significant motion blur. And that's something that is common and there are multiple ways to address motion blur in Roto, um, and actually some different schools of thought even. You will hear people suggesting different ways to address motion blur, but 
I will tell you the way that I use and the way that I've heard most often recommended. And what we'll also do is I'll break down the shot and talk about where I'd put the actual roto shapes. I'm not going to actually go through the whole process of rotoing this person in its entirety because that would be an incredibly long video. Uh, but what I intend to do is give the starting points and the methods so that way you can begin and go through the entire process. So the first thing we want to do is, of course, just like before, analyze the footage. So let's take a look. We're going to scrub through rather slowly because this is obviously a very fast motion. And what I'm looking for right now is the point at which his, because we're going to do the pinky and then kind of the side of his palm here and maybe a little up into his wrist. So what I'm looking for is the point where that part of his hand is most clear and the part where it's most complex. So I, what I need to have is throughout the whole sequence, and you can also start and end roto shapes as needed, but for the purposes of this, we're going to keep it a little simple. We need to be able to draw a shape where we know we have enough points for the rest of the movement. I'm thinking right around, I think this should be a good starting point. Now it is possible that I may even break down, like if I was actually rotoscoping this, I may break down his uh, finger into even smaller shapes. It may seem counterintuitive, but by using smaller shapes and more of them, it, it, it's really a lot less unruly than using one big shape. Because what can happen is if you make a shape that's too big, the shape changes over time and you end up not needing as many points. So the more you break down the shapes, the um, easier it can be. You're not ending up working with a bunch of points that aren't necessary. But in this case, I think it'd be fine to make one solid shape just for demonstration purposes. Now, I am a proponent of using beast blinds um, over, over Bezier's for the most part. I find that the added steps of adjusting the Bezier handles is often something that kind of adds unnecessary time. Now there are instances where you'd want to use the Bezier handles and you'll kind of feel those out as you draw shapes around things and notice um, how they contour. But in our case here, B-splines should work fine. And what B-splines are, are shapes where the uh, curve is kind of interpolated between these three points for you. So as you draw, you can see those curves are automatically added for you. And this is really great for organic shapes. So let me uh, get rid of that and we'll grab a fresh one. So we're going to head and start. We're going to go ahead and start. I'll click here. Now we can probably get a nice big sweep here around the wrist. And across the finger. Now the fidelity of your roto is also going to be dictated by the needs of your client. These are things that you'll be discussing with them or if you're in um, the industry with your supervisors and stuff. Here I'm being a little bit loose and trying to use as few points as possible. And I'm just coming around and making sure that everything's good. Cool. Now, one thing to keep in mind when rotoscoping is you're not going to be changing this shape on every frame. That's not a great way to do roto, because especially for a shot like this, we have pretty or pretty uh, smooth motions. See that swing up? That's essentially a straight line. And as we know from using keyframes, if I were to add, I have a keyframe here where I, where I created the shape. If we were to add another keyframe up here, this would move pretty smoothly to that point. So what we'll do is I think here's a good point. So we'll go one, two, three, four, five. So that would be referred to as um, rotoing on the fives. So I'm back five frames and I'm going to click and drag my shape up here. And now we're going to align it to his finger. Now, as you can see, it's getting a little tricky to see this, but what we can do, so we'll click, we'll grab a color corrector. Maybe if we just mess with the contrast a little, 
We can see it a little bit better. So we do see the tip of his finger. Now the trick with motion blur, and this can be a little challenging, you'll need to kind of try things and then you know assess, but you want to roto to where the finger actually is. You do not want to roto the motion blur. We want to actually put this shape where his finger is. And the reason for that is we can apply motion blur to our shapes. And that will blur the mat that we create and then cover this motion blur with a semi-transparent mat. So we'll be able to kind of replicate that motion. Now it can be a little tricky to see. So what we'll do is try to get a preview going. I'm going to grab a background node and I turn it red or whatever color you'd like. I prefer to use red. And we're going to mask this background node with the, the B spline. And we'll go ahead and we'll merge that over top of the footage. Oh, got to change the background color. Always forget about the luminance. I'm just going to turn down this blend a bit so we can see through it. And inside the settings for the B spline, we're going to turn on motion blur. So now you can see, and we'll probably need to up the quality. And this is something that you're going to have to be kind of turning on and off as you go through. Now I'm working with stock footage in this case, but what you would want to be able to do is get as much information about your footage as possible. So you'll need to know the frame rate and it's also helpful to know the shutter angle of the camera, which was used. Now in this case, we have no idea what was used because we don't know what camera this was shot on, but we can kind of hazard a guess. We can kind of adjust this until it matches. Now in this case, I'm going to up the blend a little bit so we can see this motion blur coming off of it. It looks like we're pretty close, but I think we might need to move this shape down a little bit. So it's pretty close. This is something that would take finessing, but we can get really close um, just by kind of assessing it in this way. Now motion blur is pretty taxing. So this is something that'll need to be, you know, disabled as you actually wrote it, or otherwise um, DaVinci Resolve will get quite bogged down. So this is obviously something that will require some more information. And what it'll also require are better frames from this frame to the frame before. So if the shape is off between frames, that'll also cause problems. So what we'll do, we'll disable motion blur because it is pretty taxing. So we'll turn that off for now. And what we'll do is create some frames in between because if we scrub through here, chances are the movement isn't perfect and that is okay. Yeah, so it does lose it a little bit. That's fine. And with this motion, we may end up, you know, creating more keyframes. But what we always want to do is split things in half. So as you can see, we've created these two keyframes and we'll want to keep... Uh, make a new keyframe somewhat in the middle of those two. So we'll move this down here. And we'll change that transparency back. And I may actually clear that preview because it's not as easy to see with that on. So we'll go back to just the spline. And we'll go in and adjust. Now we are starting to get some motion blur here. So we'll wanna make sure that we're in, in a little bit to compensate for that. Now it can pay to make big changes. Like you just saw, I grabbed the whole shape or a, part, a large portion of the shape and moved it down. That can also save time. Probably actually move these in slightly more so. Because we are starting to get some of that motion blur. It's not as intense, so it probably doesn't need to be as far in. Let's take a look and see where that uh, motion blur is going. 
Yeah, that's pretty good. And we'll always want to also preview it with the full opacity. So it looks like the finger is even further in than I had thought. So adjust accordingly. Cool. So we did get a little unlucky here. So <laughs> this movement is a little bit more irregular than I had initially analyzed. So. So we'll want to adjust these shapes accordingly. We can see by here it's already a little off. So this may be an instance of having to roto on each frame, but we only discovered that after we attempted to roto on, uh, in this case it was the fives, I believe. And it's important to not jump right into rotoing every frame. It will only cause you headache and it is totally unnecessary. Because there will be large swaths of your animation sometimes that will not need every frame. So do not do it. <laughs> Start out with big movements. Look for, look for big movements. Um, and roto in between those, especially smooth movements, um, direct, like A to B movements that aren't irregular, kind of like this, how he swings from here to here. And what we'll do, it looks like this one's a little off as well. It's going to move this down slightly because it might actually be pretty close. So let's turn on the, we'll turn on our motion blur again and see. Because the motion blur is typically going to calculate a pretty accurate picture of the motion. It's gonna do a pretty good job. There's that one. Now, the reason why this one's solidifying on the side here is because we don't have any extra frames to the left. But I just wanted to demonstrate the basic idea of how you would go about rotoscoping motion blur. And you can ask, ask questions in the comments. I'll do my best to answer as many as I can with regards to this. But the trick with rotoscoping videos is it can get so tedious to just sit there and watch somebody rotoscope all day. So I don't want to go through this and kind of do all that. For the next part of the video, I have a completed rotoscoping of somebody um, that will kind of demonstrate kind of in more depth how my thought, what my thought process is when I'm uh, rotoscoping. And we'll also look into how to rotoscope hair. So let's head over there a while. Alrighty, for the final portion of this video, we're gonna switch gears a little bit. Things might look a little different. It's because we're inside a wonderful piece of software called Silhouette. This is made by a company called Boris FX. You might be familiar with Mocha which is another piece of software that they make that you might be familiar with from uh, um, After Effects because um, it comes a light version of it comes with it. Now, the reason I did this roto inside of um, Silhouette is not because DaVinci Resolve couldn't do it, but because I was having some troubles with my own installation of DaVinci Resolve. So because roto is quite tedious, I decided to just play it safe in this case so that way I could get this video out for y'all in a timely manner. Now, what I'm going to do is kind of talk about this a little bit, and especially what we're going to do is once we're done looking at this in silhouette, is we'll go back into Resolve and kind of take a look at how we do things like the hair. And sorry, my voice just cracked. I am definitely 32 and not 14. Because especially one of the things that I was always wondering for a while is how the heck do I do like finer hair and things like that? Because this is all totally 
animated. We have a woman underwater. So this provided, you know, a bit of a challenge um, for a couple of reasons. One, because of her hair. Hair in general is kind of a uh, tricky thing. Now, if we zoom in a little bit, obviously this is quite a quick and rough roto. Um, this is mostly for demonstration purposes. But this kind of shows what I mean when I say we're breaking down the shapes. And some of these, even this, could have gone even into a smaller shape. So one that wraps around her lower lip and then one that wraps around her upper lip and then one around her nose. But this is a good thing to look at to understand what I mean when I say, let's break these shapes down. And it makes life a whole lot easier because if you tried to sort of make a shape for her entire skirt, it would get out of hand very fast. What I also do is end up with shapes that disappear and appear. We can see one here. So we kind of have that overlap happening. And that complicates things if we're doing one large shape. So break down your roto into smaller pieces. And it's going to make life so much easier. Now let's talk about the hair. Now hair is a tricky thing. Because typically when we draw roto shapes, we're drawing these... Um, closed splines but when we get into fine hair shapes like these now these may look like closed splines because we see this outline here but these are actually what are called open splines so these are created like this so they're just a line and then what silhouette allows you to do is change the width of that line and then you can also change the caps. And if we click on these points, we can also change their width. So if we have a hair that tapers off at the end, we can taper it just like so. And now we only have a couple of points to work with. So we're able to manipulate hair in really easy ways. Now it took me a little while, but I was able to find kind of a sort of similar way to do this in Resolve as well. Now, if anybody would like to see some uh, beginner roto or paint stuff and silhouette as well on the channel, please let me know in the comments because I'll be totally honest with you. This is the software that I use to roto. I don't use Resolve itself to roto, but I do use silhouette instead. But the thing is, you got to use the tool that you have and uh, DaVinci Resolve is perfectly capable of doing it. It's just that Silhouette has some creature comforts. Um, one of those being, one of my favorites being this my magnetic uh, tool here that allows you to kind of manipulate multiple points at once. Makes it really easy for organic shapes. But well, let's hop back into Resolve and we'll take a look at how to do open splines inside of Resolve. So we're back in here and th these are all the shapes but imported into Resolve all but the hair because um that export apparently does not support bringing uh the open splines from silhouette into resolve but we can solve that so let's take a look here we're going to change the color of these mats so we can see them nicer make it red and i just have a mat control here and all that's doing is it's going to just kind of feather the edges a little bit. So it ends up looking kind of like that. We have kind of a little bit of softness going on around the edges. Now to create an open spline, we're going to grab our B spline. And we're just going to, let's focus on this shape here. Now the same as any other roto, we're going to try to use as few points as possible. I'm going to click through here and up. I think I might have needed an extra point there, so I'll just backtrack a little.
and we'll bring this in a little closer. And what we'll do is we'll grab a background node and I'll change this to red. Actually, we'll make it contrast with the rest of the mats. So we'll make it uh, a blue. And what we'll do is we'll merge that over our footage. Now we won't see anything yet. What we need to do is go into the B spline and we'll change the border width. Now you can kind of start to see where we're going with this. I want to soften the edge a bit as well. Maybe bring in the width. All right, so we now have our spine covering our hair. So what we want to do is go from um, clicking and appending, which is adding more points. We want to click insert and modify. And that can be, that's a, also a, the hotkey for that is shift I. So we'll switch to that. And we'll move a couple of frames for or backward in this case. And we'll just start moving these points. And now this will animate nicely between. Might need some in between points like before. Um, we want to start with as few as possible. So in this case, I'm starting in between the, in the very center of both points that I just made. And then what you would do is repeat, keep going through the sequence, adjusting the points as needed. So I'm obviously not going to do the whole thing, but I think you get the picture. Now, one of the obvious limitations is that these splines are going to be the same width throughout the entire spline. So that does cause, can cause a bit of an issue. Now that is a limitation with the resolve that I don't believe has a solution by way of like the studio version, because I have the studio version and I would was not able to find a way to do tapering to that extent but for a lot of rotos this is going to get you there and it's much better than drawing uh actual shapes around the hair because especially when you get super fine hairs so what you can do if you do need to fudge it a little bit if since you don't have the ability to taper all of them i would make the border width match the width of the thinnest part of the hair. Generally speaking, unless it's a close-up of hair and you can see, really see those flyaways and really see them in detail, I don't think anybody's really going to notice, especially if you're doing it for fun. If you're just learning, you know, it doesn't matter too much because as you saw, there are tools out there that can elevate this process a bit. Um, if you find that you're getting asked to do Roto a lot and getting paid for it especially. But DaVinci Resolve does give us the tools that we need to do this just fine. And what you can also do is use multiple open splines or, you know, in some cases, if it is a little bit thicker, you could get away with using a uh, regular Roto shape. But I did want to tackle hair because it's one thing that I, I didn't never really saw a lot in a lot of other tutorials is how to tackle fine hairs. So... I think I'll do one more um, just to kind of demonstrate kind of a thinner one. Um, so maybe this one here. So let's go back to the beginning. Yeah, this is a nice one. It is pretty uniform, so it'll work pretty well. It does taper a bit at the end, but we'll kind of adjust it so that way it we get the most coverage that we can with the limitations that we're working with. So we'll grab a B-spline and we'll click and create our shape. Cool. And we'll switch to insert and modify. We'll grab, we can actually duplicate this background node here. Plug that in, merge that over. Now, what you could actually do is of course, add it to the, add the new one to the end here. 
but I'm kind of keeping things separate just for the sake of this. Because what I ended up doing before too is see how you end up uh, with a bunch of these connected together. That is totally fine to do it that way and definitely encouraged. So we'll add some border width. And what we're doing here is I'm just going to take a look and make sure that is going to match the width of the smallest portion of it. There we go. And now in this case, we'll take a look how it moves. So it looks like it starts to go behind her around that point. So we'll make sure that we, I'll, I'll set the second point there. It does get a little tricky to see, but I think we got it. As we can see, some of our in-between frames are starting to kind of fall off a little bit, but we'll pick a frame right in the middle. Now, typically, I would not go back and fix this this quickly. Um, this range that I've done here from 6 to 0 I would go through the entire shot at six and then only then go back and put frames in between. And by frames, I do mean keyframes. So that's how we more or less recreate uh, open splines inside of DaVinci Resolve. Now, one of the things I did want to touch on real quick is organization, because I brief briefly showed this group here. So what I would recommend doing, in this case, this is all of the roto shapes um, from that were exported from Silhouette. So there's really no organizational structure. But what I would recommend doing when you're rotoing in Resolve is when we have is separate the portions of your subject as well. So say for example, this might be hair and to, we'll pretend this is, well, these are both hair, but we'll pretend this is just the hair. And what we'll do is say, we can add a um, backdrop or an underlay, I should say. So you can create an underlay. So we can rename the underlay to something like uh, open spline hair. And say, for example, for this, this could be we'll add another underlay. And we can rename this to, say, a uh, head. Because when you have tons and tons of these B splines, it can be very tricky to navigate them. So you always want to be labeling. Otherwise, things will get out of hand pretty quickly. And we can also, of course, change the color. And that just keeps things organized. I'd highly recommend doing that. Don't fall into the trap of creating all these uh, splines on the same node, on the same like background and merge node, because you'll end up getting lost. Um, and you want to be able to very quickly go back and find specific splines. I wouldn't recommend going in and renaming every single spline um, as like, hair left hair one left hair two left hair three that is not necessary and i don't think anybody does that as long as you know where the hair is that should be enough um, and then you can kind of narrow it down and be able to click through just a handful of nodes instead of a ton so we've gone over a bit today i wanted to keep things rather compact because rotoscoping is a big topic but i wanted to touch on things that sometimes i'd see left out things like how to address motion blur where to roto for motion blur and things like open splines and using those for hair and even like organizational tips and things like that. So the trick with Roto is of course to make a video where you rotoscope an entire person is going to be disastrously long, but I think this uh, gives you the tools that you need to begin. And it really is about beginning. There isn't much to rotoscoping. There's ways to make it better, make it more efficient to do it, to streamline it and make it simpler and faster. But at the end of the day, you are just drawing shapes around things and moving them over time. But as I mentioned before, make sure to review as you go through. Make sure your shapes are working. Make sure to only rotoscope on larger uh, movement. We want to leave a lot of space between our keyframes and then only add more complexity as time goes on. You also want to make sure that between frames that the points are staying in roughly the same spot on your subject. 
that'll make a much better looking mat. And really, it's just a matter of doing it. I'd recommend going on, uh, there's some great sites for footage, like pexels.com. Um, I'll leave a link for it in there. Grab some footage and just start practicing. But make sure to break down those shapes into the smallest you can, and then you'll be in good shape. As I mentioned before, if you have any questions, if anything's not clear, leave them in the comments. Subscribe if you'd like to see the uh, upcoming videos in this series. And I think that'll be all for now. Hope you have a great rest of your day. See ya.